this evening. Uh, so Yama, everyone, um, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's lecture, uh, Warra Warra Why, Understanding Dharawal Spirituality with Ray Ingray. This is actually the last lecture uh, in a series of lectures and events that we've had called The Eight Days in Game, uh, which is marking the eight days that the endeavour was anchored at uh, Game or Botany Bay and also the continuation of Dharawal culture today. And um, I can see some faces of people who've joined us for multiple events. So I hope you've found it as um, enriching and um, yeah, as illuminating as what I have. Um, for everyone who, who doesn't know me, my name is Marika Duchinsky. I'm a Gomori and Manandanji woman, um, and I've newly joined the Chachak Wing Museum team as curator Indigenous Heritage. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today the Gadigal people, as well as the many Aboriginal clan groups who have honoured and cared for this place since the first sunrise. I pay my respects to Elders past and present, and I extend that respect to all First Nations people who join us today. As we work, visit, learn, and share knowledge on this story land, may we also respect and seek the ancient wisdom embedded forever here through the custodians who carry that knowledge with them today. To introduce Ray to you, Ray is a Dharawal person from the La Perouse Aboriginal community. Ray has a number of leadership roles within his community, including chairman of the Gujaga Foundation, with whom we've been partnering on the Eight Days in Game um, uh, program. Uh, so that's all from me. Um, would you please join me in welcoming Ray Ingray? Nagami ba yelling jan a Nagang Rangra Gamango ba Garangunga Gurwara Nalamanga Narunguli da Naya Nalamajang Garigunguli Nurnung Naya Darwu Wulawala Nali Yilamara Nurnung Yagan Gamringa Darwulanga. That translates to hello and how are you all? Uh, my name is Ray Ingra, I belong the coast of Sydney. Uh, and live at a place called La Perouse. Um, it is here at Ngarunguli. Uh, we are gathered on the lands of the Gadigal family group. Uh, my grandmother's grandmother lived in old Aboriginal camps along Sydney Harbour in the mid to late 1800s. Uh, I also mentioned that our old people lived here because it was their country and their cultural obligation to be here. And I'm speaking to you in Darawal. Um, as Marika uh, mentioned, I'm the chairman of the Gujaga Foundation. Um, the Gujaga Foundation, I'll explain in a little bit, but our community is the La Perouse Aboriginal community, which I'll also share a little bit as well. Um, it's on the northern arm of Botany Bay. And just to give you a little insight into Game, um, I'm going to share a video, and, and those that have uh, been in sessions this week with us, um, you'll notice that these videos you may have seen before, but it should all come into play and it all relates to our country.
So this year marks 252 years since the Endeavour navigated its way up the eastern coastline of what we now call Australia. Um, this session, um, it's a bit more formal. I'm standing up in front of you and I've got notes. The last couple of sessions, those that joined us would remember we're a bit more informal, so hopefully, um, hopefully this is okay with you guys. So we want to give you a different insight to the events that occurred all those years ago at Kame. But to do so, I want to take you on a bit of a journey so you could get a better understanding of our people, our community, our culture, and to get that unique inside of the view from the shore. So in this session, we're going to weave in and out of time, touching on events that happened a very long time ago, to more recent ones, including the establishment of the La Perouse Aboriginal community and our efforts over the past two decades to better our community's position to reuse their traditional language, which we call Darawal. My talk relates um, to Warawarawa, which is the first words being spoken by Aboriginal people on the eastern coastline to the crew of the Endeavour. Dr Paul Irish and Dr Shane Ingray, along with myself, co-authored an article to commemorate the 250th anniversary called Warra Warra Warra, What Was Really Said to Cook, which features in East Coast Encounter of 1770, Reflections on a Cultural Clash, published by the Sutherland, Historical, Sutherland Shire Historical Society to commemorate that 200 years anniversary. On the morning of, of Sunday the 29th of April, 1770, the crew of the Endeavour spotted shelter outside of Kamei. As they sailed up the coast, as one of the small boats spent the morning taking soundings of the bay's entrance, Banks and others watched Aboriginal people on the shoreline through their spyglasses. In the afternoon, Lieutenant James Cook led a party of several dozen in two boats to land at Kernel. As they grew close, it was observed two men, it was observed, two men with different kinds of weapons came out and made towards us. They dis bespoke pleasure, displeasure, they threatened us and discovered hostile intentions often crying to us, warra warra warra. If the meaning of those words was unclear in 1770, when they were heard again 18 years later as the first fleet sailed into Kamei, there was no uncertainty. Aboriginal people were telling them to go away. Or were they? The arrival of Cook at Kamei in 1770, followed by the first fleet in 1788, are such iconic moments in Australian history that it is difficult to separate fact from legend. It is often surprising when you return to the original accounts of these events what is recorded and what is not, what was understood and what was assumed. The fog of later mythology has obscured original uncertainties and simplified these early cross-cultural encounters into solid, linear stories, stories that are of course told from the perspective of Europeans. Cook's short stay in Kame was not always celebrated or commemorated by Europeans in Sydney, nor was he always viewed as a founding father of colonial Australia. His status evolved throughout the 19th century, as did the meaning attached to the events of 1770. Initially, Sydney siders, receptive to Aboriginal perspectives, as the only eyewitnesses still living in Sydney, it was Aboriginal people who pointed out the location of Cook's landing place when the first commemorative plaque was placed there in 1822. Others recorded the recollection of old Aboriginal people in the early colony who were either present in 1770 or heard accounts firsthand from relatives. But by the end of the 19th century, these perspectives were ignored and mythology of Cook landing had not taken root. These new accounts commemorated in art, in reenactment, 
and in early history books are only loosely based on recorded events and cast Cook as a benevolent explorer while Aboriginal people moved out of his way. Over the past 50 years, historians have probed beyond these myths, seeking to better understand Australia's early colonial history. The edited publications of key journals from the Endeavour and then the First Fleet from the 1950s to the 1970s have made this history more accessible and allowed the events of 1770 and 1788 to be interpreted from original sources. While this has led to many valuable insights, the interpretation of Aboriginal people's actions has continued to rest on an assumption that the writers of these accounts understood what they were recording. In the absence of other information, this may seem fair enough, but there is a certain laziness in not considering that there might be alternative interpretations. Even small details can have important consequences, as the interpretation of the first recorded Aboriginal words in Eastern Australia shows. So what did the Europeans actually hear? In 1770, the only person to record the words spoken by the two Aboriginal men on the shore was Sidney Parkinson. Cook was right there, but he could not understand one word they said. Both Joseph Banks and Parkinson noted the seemingly threatened gestures that the men made, but Parkinson did not provide any thoughts as to what Warra Warra, Warra meant. We have to fast forward 18 years when the same words were recorded as spoken by armed men on the headlands of Kamei and Sydney Harbour as Europeans sailed past. Like Parkinson, most simply recorded the combination of words and gestures. For example, as Hunter sailed through Kamei Heads, he described a number of the natives assembled on the south shore and by their motions seemed to threaten. They pointed their spears and often repeated the words, Warra Warra. Observers such as Richard Johnson, who put two and two together, still made it clear that the meaning was assumed. He wrote, As we came near them, they spoke to us in a loud, dissonant manner, principally uttering these words, Warra Warra Warra, which we judged to be tell us to go away. These uncertainties were lost when variations of these words appeared in several early Aboriginal word lists, where they are simply said to mean go away. It is unlikely that Aboriginal people were asked for a definition as most of the creators of these lists were the same people who had heard the word spoken and assumed that they already knew the meaning. Some historians have grappled with these uncertainties. Dr Marie Nugent in her book Captain Cook Was Here forensically examined the records of the eight days spent by the Endeavour in Kamei in order to try to understand actions of both Europeans and Aboriginal people. Marie explores how both words and gestures could easily be lost in translation in first encounters like this. Early on the same day as the landing, Joseph Banks recorded that Aboriginal men had invited our people to land by many signs and words which we did not understand. But they did not understand the words Nugent asked then how did they know they were not, in fact, being told to go away? Despite this, the words Warra 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 still continue to be interpreted in way by researchers and the broader public. Understandably, many people like to have a definition of such a pivotal phrase other than we don't know. And the term go away is even more attractive when we consider the symbolism of Aboriginal people squaring off against colonial invaders. But if, if we stop viewing this from the ship and take a view from the shore, what happens if we look past what Europeans thought they heard and consider the words from an Aboriginal cultural and language perspective? The La Perouse Aboriginal community was established in 1883 
as a permanent Aboriginal settlement on the northern headlands of Kamei through the actions of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. The remaining Aboriginal people from camps around Sydney Harbour and Kamei at that time were relocated there. My grandmother's grandmother was recorded to live in camps at Rose Bay, Elizabeth Bay and Double Bay in the mid to late 1800s be before being relocated to La Perouse as one of the original five families. Her family previously worked for the Wentworth and Berry Estates. Today, La Perouse is considered a discrete Aboriginal community which includes families with ancient and unbroken routes to coastal Sydney, including Kamei. Anthropologist R.H. Matthews, along with teacher and amateur linguist Mary Everett, spent a lot of time here at Kamei in the 1890s, recording the knowledge of senior women such as Biddy Giles, Kate Saunders, Emma Timbery, Ellen Anderson, Mrs. Jetson and others, who still have descendants living at La Perouse today. In the late 1980s, senior women of the La Perouse Aboriginal community undertook their own research because they were concerned and dismayed at the continued misrepresentation of our ancestors' lives in written history, a misrepresentation that unfortunately still continues today. One of the critical issues identified by senior women was the importance of language reclamation. At the last, as the last known fluent speakers passed on, from our community in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there have been great efforts in supporting language reclamation and research activities in our community. Cultural knowledge and understanding of the local language, although fragmented, has been retained within different families and has allowed us to continue to build our capacity to teach and reuse the language in day-to-day -day efforts. We have people in our community that remember their parents and grandparents speaking fluently. An elder who's recently passed shared with us on a number of occasions moments his mother, a fluent oral speaker and granddaughter of a language informant, was threatened by the police for teaching him and his older brothers. This was the 1940s. So Dharawal people, like all cultures, have an understanding, interpretation of how things exist, knowledge, connection, and our place within the universe. We have an ontology, epistemology, and axiology, all of which are driven by our spirituality. Our Aboriginal spiritualism is a way of knowing. It explains our origin and existence as it's been spiritually founded, this is our dreaming. Dr. Shane Williams, Senior Durable Elder, explains, our people apply spiritual reasoning when we seek to understand the world through a metaphysical lens. For our people, knowledge is abstract and theoretical. It doesn't have to be scientifically proven. A spiritual explanation is logic for us. In Dharawal culture, spirit ancestors created Dharawal country and the various life forms within it. This gave way to Dharawal kinship, our Dharawal social structures and our Dharawal laws. The events that occurred in the dreaming provide Dharawal people with a spiritual reasoning for existence, why things are the way they are and how individuals connect with their kinship, the animals and plants and significant places within Dharawal country. There's a story that, a dreaming story that I want to share with you um, and it really goes to where we're going to go into with how our people interpreted those events in 1770. The story tells us how certain animals came to Dharawal country. The story was told to me by um, senior women in my community and they were told by their elders um, and those elders were, those senior women that told us were born in the 1920s and 1930s. They told us that a long time ago, some of our very old people lived in a land to the distant east, so across the water. 
They lived in a place where it started to become no good for food source. The food source started to be depleted and they had to come up with a way that they can make the journey west to lands that they knew that were better for hunting. They didn't have big enough vessels to make the journey west and the only fellow with a big enough vessel was Burukburi and he had a Baranga which is a, a really big vessel and it could fit everybody in to make the journey safely. But Burukburi was a greedy fella, he wouldn't share. So the people got together um, one night and they said, we need to hatch a plan to deceive Burukburi and we need to steal his Baranga. Burukburi's only friend Gunagan, they convinced him to distract Burukburi so they can steal his Baranga. So the next morning, Gunagan yelled out to Buripuri, come over here and let me look for some mullahs in your hair, and that's uh, hair loss. And because he had long hair and a bit dreadlocky, he'd get real aggravated, um, he decided he'll let his friend look and catch some of the lice in his hair. So Buripuri pulled up um, his barangay on the sand, tied it to a nearby rock, and lay down and let Buri Buri, uh, Gunagan search through his hair. Buripuri would sit up and look at his baranga and sit back down, sit up and sit back down until he got comfortable and he said to Gunagan, is my baranga okay? And he had two pieces of stick and he tapped them together and he said, I'm tapping it, can you hear it? And so as he got comfortable, Gunagan signalled to the other people to take his baranga and they snuck over, quietly untied it, quietly pushed it into the shallow water quietly got in, quietly started to row away. And just as they were nearly out of sight, for some reason, Buripuri sat up and saw that his baranga was, uh, was stolen and not there. And when he looked and he saw that the people were rowing away, he got really angry and he got into a fight with Gunagan. Gunagan was only a small fella. He didn't stand a chance against Buripuri. Gunagan in the fight picked up one of those sticks and stabbed Buripuri in the top of the head. And Buripuri picked him up and slammed him on that rock that he tied his baranga to and Gunagan flattened out and fell into the shallow water. Buripuri jumped in, that stick dislodged and blood started pouring at the top of his head but he didn't care, he just wanted his baranga back. As the pursuit lasted for a couple of days and everyone in on the boat started getting tired and they started to give up. But there was a short, stocky fellow with big, strong arms and his name was Garaway. He said, let me row, I'll get us there. And he started rowing. But he was a bit of a show-off fella, so as he was rowing, he was saying, look at my arms, look how big they are. You know? But as he was doing that, he started growing fur and funny ears and a, and a black nose. As Buripuri was following behind him, he was swimming, he was going down deeper and deeper. And as he would get deeper, he would grow fins and a tail. And every time he'd come up, a blood stop, but it was turned into salt water, and he'd blow salt water out of the top of his head, furious that he was deceived by his good friend Gunagan. The next morning they reached land and Galu was a dancer in the community. He started dancing on one spot, but he started growing feathers and a beak and talons and he danced that much he made two holes in the barangay and water come up. They reached the beach, they pushed the, got out and pushed the barangay and it turned upside down into Gangmen Gang, which is Windang Island off Lake Illawarra today. Buripuri didn't see that. He didn't see that it turned into island, so he travelled north, continuing to search where Baranga is. Gorilla is the koala, he went to the nearest tree and he climbed it, crying, ashamed at the way he looked, so he shouldn't have showed off. Ashamed at the way he looked and he hugged that tree and went to sleep because he was that tired. Galu keeps, every time he gets excited, his wings come out and he dances on one spot. And Paul Gunagan is um, in the shallow water, he's starfish, so... He still stays in the sh him and his uh, descendants still stay in, in the shallow water. Buripuri is a humpback whale. And we know, our elders said, we know where Buripuri and his descendants have been because uh, some of the islands in Sydney Harbour all the way down to, to Shalhaven were made by Buripuri and descendants by thinking that they spotted their canoe, went around it, realised it wasn't theirs and then continued off on their journey. And so that tells us how certain animals came to, to this country. It tells us how, why they have certain 
characteristics as well. Does anyone know that humpback whales still have lice? No. No, they got lice. Um, this, was, this was a surprise to us. They um, have these crab-like little creatures on them and they're going to send me a photo. We did training with orca, mammal handling training, and they showed up these pictures and everyone was shocked. But we were like, ah, it makes sense because our dreaming tells us that he had lice. So it makes sense that he would still have lice today. So it shows us that he has those human characteristics. I want to share with you another dreaming story because this also talks about why um, it'll go into what our people were trying to interpret what was happening as well during the endeavour sailing into Gamay. So when the endeavour came into view, it would have been a confusing and surreal event. We know from written and community history that the Gamangul, the people belonging to Botany Bay, interpreted this strange event through a spiritual lens. Our old people wondered if the endeavour, with its billowing white sails, was a low-lying cloud, bringing the afterlife back people from the afterlife back to this country? Was it another wave of animals coming? We're going to leave the dreaming and we're going to come back to recent times and I want to talk to you about our endeavours around languages. As well as the spiritual reason that informed our people's reaction to the arrival of the endeavour, we can also take another look at the words that were spoken from our viewpoint. Since 2011, uh, 2001, the Dharawal Language Program has been researching and teaching the Dharawal language at La Perouse. Working closely with Dharawal elders and linguist Dr Yuta Bessel, the program created resources that are used in teaching Dharawal language to children and adults 
in the Lapras Aboriginal community and now more broadly. The program undertakes a rigorous confirmation process by reviewing material ranging from early colonial documents, previous linguistic and anthropological publications and field notes, audio recordings of Dharawal people in the 1960s and the language still being used in the community today. Just to give you an example of some of the work by the Dharawal Language Program, we have a immersion program in our community controlled early years education centre. They deliver adult classes and now starting to expand those services to other educational settings throughout Eastern Sydney, Southern Sydney and South Western Sydney. So if I was a child attending Gurjaga, I'd be exposed to language and culture. I'd be asked by the aunties and uncles, the staff at the, the centre, what are you nigangli wala? Monday in Igangli Dunba, Wajit Yu Yendra, or Nanda Yirabi Bujan. So they'll be asked things for everyday use like, you know, where's your head? Go get your hat, go to the tree or sand, and do you see the bird or do you see something else? I'll be singing children's songs in Durable, such as Head, Shoulders, Knees and Toes, Rain, Rain, Go Away, Incy, Wincy, Spider, all those types of good children's songs that engage our kids. I'd be hearing about our old dreaming stories and some recent ones as well. At the end of the day, when mum or dad comes to pick you up, they'll get told something like, Monday, Yenigangli, uh, Gama, go get your bag, Yenigangli, go home. And they'll be then said, Nandawabi, to everyone um, as they're leaving the centre. An important source of information for our program are the writings of linguists and anthropologists who visited our old people in the mid-late 19th century. They recorded language and cultural information as early as the 1860s and 1870s. Andrew Mackenzie interviewed Aboriginal people from coastal Sydney to the south coast of New South Wales and provided language information to various government and educational institutions. In Mackenzie's Thurrawal, which we pronounce Thurrawal today, Warra Warra is documented as meaning dead. Dr Bessold in her thesis, Language Recovery of the New South Wales South Coast Aboriginal Languages, provides examples of the use of Warra Warra, Warra from Mackenzie's work in 1874. In documenting Thurrawal stories, Mackenzie writes Warra Warra Mbala meaning they fall dead. Nambala is a third person dual bound pronoun. Looking at the materials, there appears to be an association between dead and white in both language and culture, which may help to explain the reaction of our people to the white strangers on the endeavour. In the Durrumba and Durga languages spoken by the neighbouring cultural groups to the south of the Durrawal, Bessold's works captures the term Warra Warra as both dead and white as well. Like Mackenzie, amateur anthropologist R.H. Matthews undertook extensive field work in the 1890s and early 1900s from coastal Sydney to the far south coast of New South Wales. Matthew also interviewed senior men and women relating to their tradition, customs and languages. Matthew's documented Dharawal words associated with the colour white, which incorporate the language term wara, such as yilawara wara, which means white, warabugan, meaning white ink fish, and so on. There are also cultural linkages between the word wara wara and objects that are associated with the colour white. This includes the iconic Australian flower, the waratah. In the Dharawal dreaming story associated with Dharawal women, the Waratah was originally white in colour and was stained red with blood of the Wonga pigeon. Another name, Manangawang, has been recorded for Waratahs also in Darawal, but this name is reflective of the women's side of our culture. In most Aboriginal language, dual meaning or for words are common. Take in Darawal, for example, Baranga, Buriburi's vessel, means large 
like is large vessel, but also means island today because in the dreaming it turned upside down and turned into island. In Gamilaroi, the word yama means both hand and hello and so on. In the Warwick case, there seems to be a common origin of the words for dead and the colour white. As First Fleet Marine Watkin Tench states in his papers, it may be remarked that they translate the epithet white when they speak of us, not by the name which they assign to this white earth, but by which they distinguish the palms of their hands. Interestingly, in the Wabigal language of the nor north of Sydney, Wara means palm of hand as well. In both the Dharawal and Dharamba texts of Mackenzie's and Matthews, you will find a subject bound pronoun wa, which translates to they all. R.H. Matthews gives examples of this pronoun, documenting Nandawa and Nagam Bambiwa, which translates to they saw and they have been good, respectively. Purely from a language perspective, the words Warra Warra wa, originally documented by Parkinson in Kame in 1770, translates to they are all dead. This is also consistent with the way the Gamangul behaved throughout the endeavour's eight days in Kame. In Dharawal culture, contact with spirits from the afterlife was mostly avoided by the general community. To engage would create a spiritual consequence and the crew of the endeavour constantly experienced these avoidance behaviours and couldn't understand why the Gamangul would not engage with them.
So, as Uncle Shane mentioned or alluded to that um, Aboriginal culture has a non-communication um, part of, of our everyday way that we would communicate. Non-verbal communication serves as a gestural language and could be understood across many cultural groups. It's a good way to use non-verbal communication when you're hunting or you're talking to people at a long distance or that may not know the same language you speak. It's still relevant and actively used in Aboriginal communities throughout Australia to communicate, particularly with the hearing impaired, other tribal groups with different languages, and as I mentioned, when hunting, etc. As nonverbal communication was not so prominent in European influenced cultures, when viewed through a Western lens, these behaviours could easily be misunderstood, dismissed, or not recorded at all. The English interpretation of Warra Warra Wa to mean go away was very much based on personal interpretations about the gestures that accompanied the words. The raised spears and shouted words appeared to Europeans to be signs of aggression and warning, but this assumed that gestures have universal meanings. Taking the non-verbal aspect of communication into account, we can now reflect on the two men who opposed Cook and his crew coming ashore. What were they and the others observed in later years gesturing? We may never know exactly, and this should remind us that the Europeans could not only have been certain about their meanings either. For far too long it's been accepted that the only valid source on events like these are the conjectures of foreigners trying to understand a deeply complex culture. In this case, trying to interpret a culture that has been continually developing from deep in time in an eight-day stopover. These are valuable records and accounts, of course, but they are not the only source or perspective we can draw on. When we go beyond the British interpretations about the words Warra Warra wa from the ship, when we consider other linguistic information and the spiritual and cultural context of what was happening, a very different and more plausible picture emerges. These events much more, make much more sense from our cultural perspective and complements the written evidence to give a more balanced account on what happened all those years ago. Thank you. <laughs> Question time, I suppose. Frozen. Any questions? Any comments? Yeah. We'll, we'll just get you the mic because they're recording so they can hear your voice so better. I'm, you know, presumably from your account there was a point at which the local Aboriginal people started to realise that the invaders were actually people and not spirits of the dead. Yeah. Um, and I can, you know, there, there's some really you know, quite entertaining uh, accounts of that, even quite humorous. Um, and I'm not sure from memory whether they were 
<clears throat> from 1770 with uh, Cook's first visit to Kame or whether they were perhaps 1788. But one, one in particular is when I think uh, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the British actually asked one of his men to drop his pants to reveal, um, you know, his, his gender. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was Philip. Philip did it on the north arm, yeah. So um, I think once they left after eight days, um, because the same reaction occurred with a couple of the ships that came first with the first fleet, because not all 11 ships turned up on the same day. Yeah. Um, and during that time, while they were waiting for the rest of the ships to turn up, they, it was too aggressive. The response was too aggressive on the south side. So they went to the north side. Um, there was a, um, in that occasion, there was a young uh, a man and he was curious because there was a young boy as well. Oh, yeah. um, and um, he was wearing a hat and he was interested about the hat um, from memory. And they still didn't know what, was um, what Philip, if because they wore the wigs and stuff, they didn't know if they were male or female at that time. So, yeah, they asked him to drop his dax. Obviously, he refused and got one of his sailors to show that they were male rather than female. And there was a short, at that time, there was a short engagement. And then after the Aboriginal man got a bit bored with it, he just went, wara and dismissed them and walked off and left them just standing there, yeah. So, he, um, yeah, that's a, that's a one that we... Um, yeah, he's well, well recorded, that one. And, yeah, they, it was quite human. Like, the point in, I think it was after, the term Wara became the name for non-Aboriginal people in the first couple of years of the colony. Um, and when we look at it from our perspective, that's the name there where Sydney Cove got its, derived its name from, which is recorded as Warang or Warani, and it's just recorded as the place where they were living. Yeah, the white people live. And then its name changed over time. But we still, our old people would refer to um, non-Aboriginal people as uh, non-Aboriginal lady. They will refer to them as Waterman. Or, and and it, over time it got changed to Wadjaman, but it was Waterman. And um, so that still is in our community today in regards to that reference to that water. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> Thanks, Ray, as always. Um, can you talk a bit about how kids are going with that language program? Like, and I know that Gujaga's got a method of um, also teaching parents so that they learn at that similar kind of rate. And how is that going for the community and the language itself? Yeah, it's uh, um, it's getting improving because there's um, a lot more openness now um, in regards of resources that are coming. Um, particularly from government, um, but also to that openness from the broader community. We have a lot of um, services now, particularly early childhood services, where they've got no Aboriginal kids at all, let alone Dharawal kids, saying um, our parents, if they want their kids, if they're going to teach a, a, another language other than English, they want the local language to be taught. Um, so we're expanding quite rapidly. Um, we do teach to our young kids and at the same time to our adults because in the early days they were, um, there was our parents were saying we don't know exactly what they're saying when they're coming home, like they can only pick up words and stuff. So to make sure that it's reinforced in the home environment as well as in during the day at school, um, we teach to both adults and kids. Um, it's, it's really, we've still got a long way to go, but we're on the right path and, and that's reflective that uh, this year we had an opportunity to train up four Dharawal language tutors to go out into schools and um, we end up training up eight because of the demand and then there's actually a, a waiting list for next year's training to roll out so we're trying to meet the, trying to make sure that we can meet demand by training our young people up. But the interest is from those that started it years ago, they're just now, I think the oldest one we've got is 20. So they were young when we first started at Gujaga, but because it hasn't been followed them through their own schooling, they lost it a bit, so we've done some retraining to, to get them back up to speed again. Yeah. There was someone else with their hand up over here. Or you, just stre you were just stretching. <laughs> no, there was a hand. <laughs> 
Ray, I'm sorry. I've asked you so many questions across the three things. But I just, right, I right. feel like every time I come, I just have new questions. No. Um, first question was, um, the sh the, in the video, the elders were saying that um, one of the warriors, after getting shot, brought, came back with a shield. Yep. Is that, first question is, is that the Gweagle shield that's, or do they, do, do, do you guys think that that is the Gweagle shield that's in the British Museum? And then the second question was, um, I, this might have been covered in the video, but I have might have missed it. Is Was the name of, in the Guy Mia Lily um, dreaming story, is the, was the name of the son of the leader, like the, the guy who did the digging, was his name Guy Mia or was that? No. Oh, okay. No, no, he had a different name. Oh, though. okay. Yeah, he had a different okay. name. But that, um, that Lily um, is just, that's where Guy and me got it, derived its name from. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's a similar pronunciation. Mm. Um, as for the shield, um, unlike the spears, there, there's a, a gap in time where the sh it was unknown where the sh that particular shield went. Um, in the past, it's been labelled Gweagle Shield, even from people within my community, or it's been published that we're not too sure if they quoted it or it's just been chucked in there. Um, but in recent times, our elders wanted you know, some certainty around it because of that unknowing. And so they requested it to um, be, the wood to be tested and it, and it came back that it was red mangrove, which is found from Port Macquarie North. So the, the actual wood doesn't come and never was from this part of Sydney um, or this part of New South Wales. It was on the north coast. Um, they've had some armoury experts, one of the top armoury experts, look at, at the actual hole. And look, we understand that that exotic side that the first contact, muskets were fired and there's a hole in the shield. We get that. People levitate to that. They just, you know, that's that would be ideal. But the, the armoury experts have said that it isn't a musket hole, it isn't a bullet hole. And when you hear our elders talk, particularly the mob up north, it's that hole, there's a heap of shields with that hole is because it's the way it's been manufactured off the tree. Yeah. So there's a lot of shields with that hole in it because they basically just peg the bark to the tree and then cut around it. Yeah. So, but because people go to that exotic side and that fantasy that, you know, there was this violence and there's tangible evidence that violence occurred, people love that story and they just run with it and it snowballs effects. But, yeah, no, there's science is backing up what our elders have been saying for a little while now. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. It occurred to me, thanks to our friend over here who's wearing the mask, it's probably not particularly hygienic to be sharing the microphone. Oh, <laughs> yes. No, I you can, can project, yeah. absolutely, um, yeah. Um, what's the, the, the connection by both tr traditionally uh, and in contemporary times between the Darawal language and the, the al language in Sydney, in whether it's recorded? That, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting, and I I sort of mentioned it that um, what's happened in the past is people have tried the non-Aboriginal people um, or people that aren't that later on identify as Aboriginal that aren't from here have tried to reconstruct um, the Sydney language or, or labelled it the Sydney language. And they've only been able to do that from archival material. And when you do that, like Warra 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 shows that there's a lot of room for misinterpretation in the early days. Like it took two years for the colony to work out the difference between yes and no. Yeah. Aboriginal people were saying no and they were thinking they were agreeing. The other one is that um, there was an assumption by the colony at the time that all Aboriginal languages were the same. Um, Aboriginal language words were being told to Europeans, travelling Europeans, and they were bringing that back to the colony and they were Tench and Dawes and others were sharing all that. Like misunderstandings of the word kangaroo. Kangaroo, yeah, Google the word, yeah. Yeah, and so they were blackfellas here were calling sheep and cattle. Kangaroo. kangaroo. Um, and, and when we went, when we sit down, we use those archival materials, we use Dawes papers, but when we sit down with our elders in the past and even today, 
they'll say, no, that's not that, that's this. That's not that, that's that. Or that's the northern word or that's... So they, we still have that. But because our elders, our community was quite private, they, they in their ways, people like um, some of the, the terms you use who, who came up with those terms, I physically were there when they asked them to engage with them and our elders, because they said no, there was an assumption that there's no more language being spoken or, and so it gave them like a free reign type approach and us younger ones are like, no, we can't do that anymore because it, it creates a void and, and unfortunately people that without the cultural knowledge behind our language and our country. So, um, so there's that. So th to construct and use the term the Sydney language is a bit misleading because Sydney back in those days was a, a CBD area. We even fell outside of Sydney where we're standing now till a particular point in the 1800s. And so if you pick up an early colonial documentation or even right up to Matthews and think Sydney, read Sydney, people conceptualise Sydney, the greater Sydney area today, and that wasn't the case. LARPA was established because we were out of sight, out of mind of Sydney. So we weren't even in Sydney in, in 1883. So, um, and then also too to get, and I, I don't mean to dwell on it, but to just rely on um, colonial resources. There was no asking, is that your language? Is that your mother's language, your father's language, your grandparents' language, your great-grandparents' language? Is it a women's language? Is it the children's language? Is it a men's language? Is it your clan language? Is it your northern or southern dialect? Where did you come from? Because people were, Aboriginal people were coming to the colony for safe haven. So people like Paragarang, a 14 to 15 year old girl, would have most likely come here for a safe haven. And why we say that is because she came by herself. And when she left, she was well known in the colony. And when she left, no one saw her again. So people come to the colony for protection. And those questions weren't asked before they sat down and asked started documenting their languages. So William Dawes' book actually holds a lot of language from, from Upper Port Stephens. Yeah. Yep. I could go on that about days, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just following on to that, what's your view of the of non of non development within um within the language domain of like Nawi Yeah, Nawi's a good one too, because Nawi, even though it was documented as that our old people use the term mudri, which meant anything going across the water. And now he's actually a particular tree. Yeah, so they would have been saying, what's that? Obviously, it's a canoe. And they've just said, now we're talking about the tree it come from. And in lost in translation, it's been documented. Um, but where it is done in, a, in, a, in an authentic way, so local Aboriginal people are engaged properly to provide that cultural advice, it works well because it provides a broad, the broader community with a better understanding. And for us, we teach language and culture to all kids, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, Dharawal or non-Dharawal. And that way it's because our own kids get a strong cultural foundation and a good understanding on where they come from and where they belong, which sets you on a good path. Um, for non-Aboriginal kids, they're, giving, they've, they're receiving a unique insight into the world's oldest living culture so when they grow up and they're exposed to racist behaviours, they can go, oh, I've got another viewpoint on Aboriginal people. And that will help us into the future because um, we want non-Aboriginal people to have a better understanding of us so that our histories don't repeat itself. Yeah. Thanks, Marika. Ray, um, I wanted to ask you something, if that's okay. Um, Cook 2020 has recently been and gone, and I think um, it's a you know this is a hugely loaded time. Yep. Uh, I think a lot of um, Aboriginal groups at at that time really, if they cho chose to, could disengage from this. Subject, but I think the La Perouse Aboriginal community perhaps did not get that opportunity, and I and I think I saw many different media, um, you know, stories and things with you, um, you know, and and others from the community um, speaking to this 
uh, event, which was 250 years since the Endeavour's arrival. How was that time? I mean, I, I yeah, I, I don't think I've, I've heard about that from you. Yeah, look, we, what we had planned to commemorate that, it was actually, surprisingly, it was a, a real partnership, I would say, um, compared to what happened in 1970s where our people actually protested and led protests because um, they were being asked to be involved but be told what to do in those celebrations where um, this was actually quite different. It was, so we had a lot of... We had a big corroboree plan for um, our community and other communities that, um, that were, I suppose, a part of that Endeavour story. Um, and then we had a big showcase the next day to mark the anniversary in a similar way that our community did it in 1988 to commemorate the first fleet coming in to Kame. Um, and it was just a bit, I suppose, disappointing when that sort of got canned because of COVID, but that's, that's the reality of it, of, of living in a world that we do today. Um, hopefully that opportunity has created... Um, a better understanding with uh, um, different levels of government, particularly local government. So we do like the meeting of two cultures now with them in a partnership. And we also do other events like Fire Stories down at Cronulla, which got a good turnout this year. So it's um, a pretty good way to showcase local culture and, um, and tell our story our way. So it's, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ray. Um, yeah, it's th there has been so much said about the interaction between the crew of the Endeavour and the people on the shore, um, but it's incredibly special. I think you can all agree to hear it from someone like Ray um, and to also learn about Darwin's spirituality in so doing. So thank you so much, Ray, um, for everything you shared with us this evening and also everything... Uh, yeah, that you've shared with us over the course of the week. It's been a mammoth um, <laughs> week for Ray, actually. That's <laughs> he's done so much um, and I, for one, have, yeah, really, really enjoyed every moment of, of having you here. And, in fact, um, as a gesture of our appreciation, we'd like to uh, offer you this small uh, gesture from the museum um, okay. for the Gujaga Foundation, some resources for the Gujaga Foundation. Um, and on that note, would you all please join me in thanking Ray Ingray.